that has no more dominion over him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. It's 
seems like a strange image. If something gets blood on it, it doesn't become white, it becomes stained. But this blood is like no other blood. The blood Christ shed for us on the cross, with all our sins weighing upon him, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That blood purifies us. It enables us, sheep who have for so long gone astray, to hear the voice of the shepherd as he calls us by name and leads us to the fountain of living water. Springs of water bless the Lord in our lives also. It begins at the baptismal font where we're first called by name, where we first get our splash in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that first washing, and continues through this life whenever we return to that baptismal promise as we do liturgically every year in the, the Lent and Easter cycle. We're almost at the middle of the Easter part of that cycle, almost midway between Easter and Pentecost, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we hear these readings from Revelation that tell us of of a worship of which ours is but a pale imitation, but is intended to be an imitation. It was gathered around the one on the throne and the Lamb, the innumerable crowd worshiping. The fact that this crowd cannot be numbered is designed to remind us of Abraham in chapter 15, what I've called the sacrament of stars, when God invites him to go out into the night sky, not the city night sky, but the night sky in quiet country places where the stars are innumerable. Thus God said to Abraham, will your descendants be? And this is true, for Abraham is the father of us all in the faith. All those who gather around the throne of grace share the faith of Abraham, which was reckoned to him and to us as righteousness. Does that mean that our lives are always perfect in every way? After baptism, living in faith, it's all smooth sailing, right? Well, that hadn't been my experience. Nor is it the experience of those innumerable saints clad in white gathered around the throne of grace. Who are these? St. John the Divine asks. And his heavenly interlocutor said, well, they're the ones who've come through the great ordeal. The kind of Bible student called dispensationalists, maybe even letting that word come out of my mouth, <laughs> are the ones who try to identify where in human history this great ordeal, or as an earlier translation has, the great tribulation comes. Are we in the middle of a great tribulation? Uh, probably not, because none of us had any trouble getting to church this morning. And no one is interfering with our prayers or with whatever works of love we might be involved in. We face difficulties, of course. We face challenges to the faith from inside and outside the church. It has ever been so. The great ordeal with which St. John the Divine was familiar was the persecution under Nero. It got worse in the persecution under Decius. It got worse again in the persecution under Diocletian. And then when Christianity became legal and indeed became the religion of the empire, it eased off a bit. But it's everywhere. 
wherever Christianity goes in the whole world, it's opposed by our own sins, our own iniquity, by death and the fear of death that leads people to focus on this life only. The one with the most toys wins. Yeah, I don't know. I never saw you haul behind a hearse. <laughs> and not even our spiritual adversary, the devil. None of those things can snatch us out of the hand of the shepherd or of the father. The promise is not that those who follow this shepherd will never weep. The promise is that God will wipe away every tear from our lives. In Joppa, they were weeping over a woman named Gazelle. In Aramaic, Tabitha. In Greek, Dorcas. In English, Gazelle. Pretty name. Seems like she was a, a good person. She was a skilled and generous seamstress. And when the other members of that community of faith were grieving her death, they sent for Peter to come to pray with them. And they showed him some of her handiwork, some of the things that she had made. And then left alone with the body, Peter prayed. And then just as the Lord Jesus had done, he turned to her, took her by the hand. He said to her, Tabitha, get up. And she got up. Will we see that kind of a miracle in our lives? Well, it depends on how broadly you want to cast the net. The Good Shepherd uses us to help one another out in this flock. And you may have seen a fellow Christian reach out a hand to a brother or sister and raise them from the place where they were to a place nearer that throne of grace. It is the Good Shepherd who leads us to the green pasture, to the still water. He uses us to lead one another to these places of, of stillness where we can enjoy our fellowship with him and with each other. No matter how dark the path we tread, no matter how difficult the ordeal may be, or may become in the future, We have his promise that he is with us, leading us and guiding us. And of course, that even in the midst of all the things, and yes, sometimes people who trouble us, he spreads his table before us, he sets his chalice before us. That blood which was shed for us, by which we are purified, is offered again to us. His body and His blood, given up for us on the cross, bearing all our iniquities and raised, vindicated, glorified, worthy of our worship, yet given to us under those humble forms of bread and wine as an earnest that we will dwell in the Father's house forever and come indeed ourselves to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the